Hey everyone, Lily here. I know a lot of you guys struggle with answering speaking part three questions and can often only give very short answers. So in today's video, I'm gonna share with you four game-changing tips to help you provide fully developed long answers to questions in part three. These tips are not about building fancy vocabulary. What I'm going to show you are some smart strategies for approaching part three questions. We are talking about strategies here, and trust me, often your answer is too short, not because of a lack of vocabulary. It's because you've chosen the wrong angle, the wrong strategy to answer the question. This happened to me. For example, at the very beginning of my ELS journey, I was so inexperienced. I remember in part three, I got a question like this: Are there any popular historic buildings in your city? I really got a question like this, and I screwed it. So Yellow Crane Tower immediately came to my mind. I responded Yellow Crane Tower, and then went on to describe how the tower looks. This is such a bad angle to approach the question because describing the physical appearance of an ancient tower requires advanced vocabulary. You look at this tower. How was I, as a non-native English speaker, supposed to have the vocabulary necessary to describe an ancient tower like this? Impossible. So I managed to speak only a few sentences before I was unable to continue. On reflection, I realized that yes, I could talk about that tower. But I didn't have to focus on describing only its physical appearance. It's much easier to talk about what people do in the tower than the building itself, isn't it? This brings us to the first tip for answering a part three question, which is talking about people and what people do. Sometimes in part three, we get questions about places, buildings, or abstract concepts. It isn't easy to directly talk about a building or an abstract idea itself. So once you've said a little about the building or concept, remember that you can keep going by talking about the people, experiences, or events associated. Associated with that particular building or concept, I will show you how to approach abstract concepts later in the video. For now, let's focus on this tower. So at the beginning, we can give the tower a little bit of a description. Like we have this famous ancient tower called the Yellow Crane Tower. It's been around for ages, like thousands of years. Although it's just five stories high, but hey, they didn't have skyscraper tech back then. Nothing fancy here. Everybody can give a short description of a building or place like this. But of course, if we focus on describing only the tower itself, our answer won't last long. This is an ELS question. We need to be creative to give a long answer. So after this short description, how about we go on to talk about people? Talk about what people do at the spot. Like all they do is take stupid Instagram photos. Every year, the tower attracts a ton of tourists from all over the country. But it seems all they do is take stupid Instagram photos rather than appreciate the tower and its surroundings. For example, I've seen people dressing in traditional Chinese clothes to take matching pics with the tower, and some people even go to the extent of bringing multiple outfits with them just to switch things up for photos. And guess what? If you want to take pics at spots with fantastic views, you will need to queue up for your turn. How ironic it is that people go to the tower not for our traditional culture, but for stupid Instagram photos. How do you think of this angle of talking about people and what people do? Does it make building-related topics much easier? Guys, we are not native speakers. We don't have a fancy vocabulary to describe how an old building looks or the history behind it. But most of us can talk about people, experiences, and events and learns with no problem. And I've realized that we can always talk about people taking pics for Instagram if the topic is about a building or place. Here's another example. What are the most common architectural styles in your city? If we talk about only architectural styles, it's very likely that we won't be able to provide a fully developed answer. We are non-native speakers. We don't know a ton of architectural-specific vocabulary, do we? How about we add people taking Instagram pictures to our answer? At the beginning, I would give a short description of the architecture. I'm from this charming little city where you won't find many high-rises. Old traditional buildings set the main vibe here. 
Unlike concrete skyscrapers, they were built with bricks and tiles. And guess what? Most of them are still in good condition. And then to make our answer longer, we can go on to talk about people taking Instagram pics with the buildings. And you know what? These old buildings are super popular on Instagram. People come from all over the country to snap cool pictures. Like I've even seen folks wearing traditional Chinese outfits to take matching pictures with the buildings, and to maintain the city's traditional charm, even the new buildings are adopting the old school look. Even though I went on to talk about people taking pictures, the answer is still relevant. It's still about those old traditional buildings, isn't it? Remember, whether it's a part two or part three question, as long as it's about buildings or places, we can always talk about people taking stupid Instagram pictures. But what about abstract concepts? This type of talking about people and what people do works well too. Let's look at this question. Are there other ways people can learn about history apart from at school? History is a difficult topic, isn't it? So instead of talking about different ways of learning history, how about we approach it from the perspective of people who teach history? Let's say we can learn about history by watching YouTube videos. But instead of talking about YouTube videos and the school, how about we make a comparison between YouTubers and the school teachers? Like, I really enjoy picking up history through YouTube videos. School teachers, especially in China, aren't really doing a great job. It seems like they are just there to grab their paychecks. They are not into teaching at all. All they do is throw historical facts at us to memorize, and honestly, it gets pretty dull. Doesn't this question all of a sudden become much easier when we shift our focus to discussing teachers and how they teach? If I focus on talking about how boring school is, my answer probably won't be this long. I can add details like paychecks, not into teaching, and throw facts at us to memorize, all because I chose to approach the question from the perspective of school teachers and not school. Likewise, I probably can talk longer by focusing on YouTubers rather than YouTube videos. But YouTubers, they are a whole different story. They start a history channel because they are passionate about sharing what they know. They put in a ton of effort crafting animations that turn boring historical facts into something that's seriously cool to watch. Have you seen how easy it is to give a long answer if we focus on talking about people and what people do? Of course, here we can use an example to support how cool those YouTube videos are. We will add an example later. Now let's move on to the second tip, which is to think like a billionaire. So you want to use people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos in your example. You don't want to use personal examples. Then you need to think like a billionaire. At the very beginning of my LC preparation, I basically approached every question with a mediocre mindset. I mean, I answered every question like a mediocre person who lives in her mediocre world. But how can a mediocre person give long answers to questions about big ideas? You look at these past three questions. These are not shallow topics. They are hot social trends and issues. Even major news channel like a BBC report. The first one: Do you think those who do repetitive work should be given more breaks? If you were the old me, I would answer the question with a yes and say something like relax, recover, and become more productive. Seriously, if you answer the question with a yes, what else can you say except relax? But if we answer the question from the perspective of people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, who don't give their warehouse workers and factory workers many breaks, we may have a lot to talk about. Before listening to my answer, can you give it a try? Can you try to think like a billionaire? If you were Elon Musk, would you give your Tesla factory workers more breaks, and why? If you were Jeff Bezos, if you give your warehouse workers more breaks, and why? Does thinking like a billionaire? Already make things easier for you. We could answer the question from competition's point of view and say something like: Those who perform repetitive tasks often play a big role in a company's production flow. If they are given too many breaks, the company may struggle to meet its productivity targets. A perfect example of this could be Amazon's warehouse workers. 
if they took frequent breaks, your Amazon packages probably wouldn't be able to arrive within one or two days. This could put the company at a disadvantage against competitors like Walmart, affecting the success of services like Amazon Prime. This is an excellent answer. If you feel an answer like this, it's difficult to come up with. Don't forget the first tip of talking about people and what people do. Think about it. What will happen if those workers are given too many breaks? They may end up being lazy. Those who do jobs that involve repetitive tasks often struggle with motivation and staying on track. If they take too many breaks, their productivity may drop. When they get back to work, it may be hard for them to get fully focused again. And then I can still use Amazon workers as an example. That's probably why Amazon warehouse workers are monitored by machines and only given short breaks, even during long shifts. The problem is that during these breaks, it's uncertain how they will spend their time. They may end up playing phone games and find it tough to refocus on boring tasks like scanning and packing packages. The best thing about discussing people is that I can compare average workers to billionaires. This type of comparison can be applied to many questions. I will show you more examples later. So here I can say something like. Conversely, people doing creative and interesting work like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg usually don't ask for more breaks. They actively try to avoid the distractions so that they can stay super focused on what they are doing. Did you see how easy it is to talk about trending social issues if you think like a billionaire? Besides, thinking like a billionaire also allows you to use more impressive words. If you choose to talk about giving workers more breaks to relax, this kind of average idea is not only difficult to expand on, but also doesn't give you a chance to use better vocabulary like motivation, staying on track, productivity, long shifts, and scanning and packing pack. Packages. And you don't need to worry that you sound like an evil capitalist. I actually got this question in a real exam. I told the examiner, "No, those workers shouldn't be given more breaks." He was shocked. Like, you don't think they should be given more breaks? You think they should just keep working? But he still gave me a seven. The examiner doesn't need to agree with you. You don't even need to agree with yourself. You are not marked by what you say, but by how you say it. Like whether you speak fluently, use words accurately, make grammatical errors, and have good pronunciation. Believe me, you can sound cruel and still get a very high score. Now, this question: What do you think of the phenomenon of people queuing in restaurants for more than an hour? Can you try to answer it like a billionaire? Would people like Elon Musk spend their valuable time waiting in line for an hour? Why do average people do this, but billionaires don't? It isn't all about money. It's about time. How do billionaires choose to spend their time? Can you pause the video and give it a try? Here's my answer. I think they must have nothing better to do with their lives. They do a nine-to-five job they can't stand just so they can hit up those fancy places. But you know what? It's not really about the food. They are queuing up to get some Instagram photos so that they can pretend to have fancy lives. How do I know that? Well, I'm one of them, queuing for an hour to finally get the food, but let the camera eat first. Look, I talked about Instagram photos again, and just like the last question, we can make a comparison here. We can compare these average people to billionaires like Elon Musk. Would someone like Elon Musk ever waste time like that? Nope. He's busy creating exciting stuff that's actually adding value to the world. People are just different, I guess. Now, what about this question about cheap fashion? Why is cheap fashion so popular? Average people buy a ton of cheap clothes, of course, because they are cheap and stylish. But this idea isn't easy to expand on. Try to think like a billionaire. Why isn't fashion important to people like Mark Zuckerberg? Why does Zuckerberg wear the same gray T-shirt every single day? He does it to avoid decision fatigue, so that he can devote his energy to more important things. Here's my answer. At first glance, fast fashion brands like Shein and Zara are so popular because their clothes find that sweet spot of being affordable and trendy. You can buy tens of stylish outfits and rock a fresh look every day of the week without burning a hole in your pocket. 
But if you dig a bit deeper, you will find the true reason behind this trend. We've got so many folks who don't really have better things to do with their lives. They are perfectly okay with spending hours scrolling through e-commerce sites, hitting that order button, and even going through the hassle of returning clothes that just don't fit. And the best part of thinking like a billionaire is that it's easy to include a billionaire as an example. You don't want to use personal examples. This is how you can use a celebrity as an example. Ever notice how Mark Zuckerberg doesn't bother much about fashion and just wears that same gray T-shirt every single day? He's all about avoiding decision fatigue. He's saving his brain power for important business moves. And speaking of examples, I think they are really important for scoring high in Part Three. I don't know about you, but in actual exams, whenever I try to list points instead of developing the points I've just said, the examiner stopped me right away and moved on to the next question. Seriously, this happens every time. Take this fast fashion question for example. If I first say that fast fashion brands are so popular because their clothes are affordable and stylish, you can wear different outfits every single day without spending a ton of money. So if I say so little. About being cheap and stylish, and then go on to talk about the second point. Like, what's more, these brands are also very good at marketing on social media. If I do this, the examiner will probably think I can't talk in detail. He may stop me and move on to the next question. So the third tip I have for you is don't list points. Give an example instead. In part three, it's okay to give one or two personal examples, but if you use too many personal examples, like Your sister, your friend, the examiner will probably challenge you and ask something like, "What about other people?" Fortunately, it's pretty easy to turn a personal example to a general example. Let me use this question to explain. In your country, is it common that young people live with their parents? Here's my answer. Yes, it's a very common situation in today's economy. Many young people are either struggling to find jobs or stuck in low-paying positions. How are they supposed to afford to live alone? As you can see, I haven't said much about this point. Don't switch to talking about another point. I mean, don't say something like, "What's more, living with your parents means they can help with things like childcare." Don't do this. It's better to add an example to support the point you've already made, so that it becomes more well developed. Let me first show you a personal example, and then I will show you how to turn this personal example into a general one. Let me give you an easy example. My cousin, she works in a shoe factory, and her monthly pay is just three k. After taking care of daily expenses like food and transportation, she barely has any money left to even think about renting an apartment. Living with her parents lets her save a bit on rent, and guess what? Her parents also cover water and electricity bills, which allows her to save some money even with a low-paying job. This is a very common thing in China, where parents often provide support like this for their young adult children. You can give one or two personal examples like this in part three. You really can. With that said, it's actually pretty easy to turn it into a general example. So the personal example talks about my cousin who is a factory worker. How about I simply talk about factory workers instead? And it doesn't have to be factory workers. I can use any low-paying workers as an example, like fast food workers or food delivery workers. For example, we have a lot of factory workers who earn only three k a month. After they take care of daily expenses like food and transportation, there is not much money left to even think about renting an apartment. Living with their parents lets them save big on rent, and some parents also cover water and electricity bills, which allows their adult children to save some money even with low-paying jobs. Hopefully, when they save the enough, they can move out. This is a common thing in China, where parents provide support like this for their young adult children. Children, see, just like that, we turn the personal example into a general one. All you need to do is change your cousin or your friend to something more general. Let me show you one more example. We already answered this question about historical buildings earlier in the video. 
Notice that in the example, instead of saying "I saw a young lady dressing in traditional clothes," I opted for the more general term "people" to easily avoid providing a personal example. I've seen people dressing in traditional Chinese clothes to take matching pics with the tower, and some people even go to the extent of bringing multiple outfits with them just to switch things up for photos. Just like that, we have a general example. And if you find it very hard to add an example, don't forget the first tip of talking about people. Let's look at this question about history again. We've already come up with some reasons why watching YouTube videos is a good way to learn history. Now let's add an example to support it. My vocabulary about history is very limited. It's impossible for me to talk about something like a war history, but I have no problem talking a little about human history. I think the same is true of you. You, as a human being, should at least know something about human history, don't you? Like there is this video about human history. The YouTuber uses animations to walk us through different stages of human evolution. It's so cool to see how our ancestors start to use their hands to create simple tools just to survive. But gradually, we evolve and become the most complex creatures on this planet. Note that I use the present simple and not the past simple tense because I'm describing what is happening in the video. I'm not describing the past. I'm describing the video. That is why the present simple should be used. And remember, if you find a topic difficult to talk about, it's likely because you've approached it from the wrong angle. Let's say you are not familiar with human history. No problem. Just change your perspective. How about using business history as an example instead? For example, I came across this fascinating YouTube channel that specializes in editing Jeff Bezos' interviews. It's such a blast watching the founder himself, Jeff Bezos, talk about the remarkable history of Amazon and how he navigated the ups and downs of building the company. Imagine listening to a professor who has never started a business teaching Amazon's history. How boring would that be? Now, do you find it easier to add an example to your answer? You can use a personal example or a general one simply by generalizing your personal example. If you are having trouble coming up with an example, try approaching it from a different angle. Consider focusing on talking about people and see if it makes things easier for you. And here are some useful expressions you can use to introduce your example. Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you a perfect example, or let me give you an easy example, or a perfect example of this is Amazon versus Walmart. Now the last tip: if the examiner hasn't stopped you, you can talk a little about the other side of the story. For example, for this question of do you think those who do repetitive work should be given more breaks, I've already discussed the disadvantages of taking more breaks. So after this, I can talk a little about the advantages. Like with that said, if workers have good self-discipline, some extra breaks can totally help them relax and recharge, allowing them to come back to work with a clear head. I guess employers just need to try things out and see what works best for their employees. Look how fully developed this answer is. And apart from with this said, you can also use that being said, having said that, or simply say, but hey, like, but hey, if workers have good self-discipline, some extra breaks can totally help them relax and recharge. Now let me show you another example. So for this question about people queuing in restaurants, I've already explained that this happens because those people don't have better things to do with their lives, so they waste their time like this. If the examiner hasn't stopped me, I can go on and add a second point. Having said that, the whole thing about folks waiting in line for hours may also be because the food is seriously awesome. They may see a lot of rave reviews online and just decide, "Hey, let's give it a shot." You may remember that earlier in the video, I mentioned that it's better not to list points, but this is different from listing points. Listing points means that you list several points without expanding on any of them. 
But here, I've already fully developed the first point. In this case, it's okay to add another point if the examiner hasn't set stop. Finally, I want to add an extra tip, which is to actively listen to the news. Part three of the speaking test usually requires you to discuss abstract or complex topics in great detail. Often, it's not that you don't know how to express yourself; it's more about having nothing to say. After all, you don't need to use fancy words to discuss big ideas. Actively listening to the news can help you stay well informed about the big events that move the world today. This helps you get ideas for not only speaking topics but also writing topics. I recommend the WSJ World News and the Tech News Briefing. I mainly listen to them on Spotify. You can also watch them on YouTube. Their videos come with subtitles, making it easier to follow along. Alright, here are all four tips we've covered in this video. Let's recap. For questions that ask you to discuss buildings or places, apart from describing the buildings or places themselves, also try talking about what people do in those places. If you limit yourself to only describing the buildings, it can be challenging to give a well-developed long answer. Secondly, for abstract or complex topics, try to think like a billionaire. Ask yourself, how would people like Jeff Bezos answer the question? After all, how could a mediocre mind discuss complex topics in great detail? Finally, avoid listing points. Instead, provide an example or discuss the other side of the story. You can offer personal example or a generalized one. If you having trouble coming up with example, consider focusing on discussing people. It might make things easier for you. That's it for this video. I also have a video about speaking part two strategies. I encourage you to go ahead and check it out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.